Okay, well, welcome to the latest in our Retire Abroad Virtual Roadshow webinar series, um, the last, in fact, of the series. Um, today, we aim to give you some of the, an idea of some of the financial issues you need to consider as you uh, plan your retirement to France. Um, uh, failing to plan can be very expensive, and although every situation is unique, uh, and professional advice is essential for someone who's able to look at both the consequences in the UK as well as in uh, as in France. Um, there are a number of general principles and detailed rules you need to be aware of, so we aim to um, make you aware of those today. Um, I'm Nigel Ayres. I run Expat Network. Um, I've lived in Hong Kong, Malaysia, uh, the US twice, and for the last three and a half years in, in Spain. Uh, we're joined today by George Shepard of Blevins Franks, and uh, he'll introduce himself uh, in a moment. Uh, before we start, just want to emphasize, if you have any questions, please use the button on your screen. Uh, we'll answer every question we can during the webinar. Any that we can't, uh, we can uh, deal with afterwards. Just to note that um, if you're using a nickname rather than your actual name in, in logging on to this, then we may not be able to tie you back to the original registration details we have. So if you have any questions that don't get covered or you think of something after the event, just send us a, an email at expats at expatnetwork.com and we'll either answer it or we'll pass it on to uh, George or whoever's relevant to to answer that question. Um, okay, so perhaps we get started and with um, George, if you could uh, give us a, a little background about yourself and, and, and Blevins Franks. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you, Nigel. Um, I am a partner here in the Bergerac office for Blevins Franks. It's a fully functioning office with other partners, uh, private client managers. I've been here now for a complete four years in January and um, into my fifth year. Previously, I, I started my career in 1990 with Noble Lounge, Sedgwick, and looked after the big um, final salary schemes in the UK, like Rolls Royce, etc. I then set up my own um, wealth management practice in Scotland, built that up over a ten-year period, sold that successfully to Skipton Building Society. I was then with Fisher Investments before arriving here in France with Blevins Franks. Um, Blevins Franks are probably. Europe's biggest wealth manager. We have offices throughout France, um, Valbon, New York, all over France. So it may not me, be me, the partner, that would look after an individual, depending on where they end up. Um, but we are uh, regulated to give advice here in France, as I am, uh, which is quite an important point, because after Brexit and the withdrawal agreement, UK advisors, um, a lot of banks, institutions are no, now no longer legally allowed to give advice to French tax residents. We have the regulatory, we have the professional indemnity, and um, everything in France is, is set to do what we need to do for people arriving in France. So that's a little bit of background to me. Um, hopefully that helps, Nigel. Okay, well, thank you, Drew. Um, so let's get started in, about sort of financial planning generally, if you like. Um, as people prepare to retire, uh, typically, you know, they need to make various decisions. I guess the focus um, perhaps switches from building their retirement fund to uh, generating income to fund their retirement. And that's true of anybody wherever you retire. Um, are there any sort of added complications, if you like, by moving abroad that... Um, that do that and what are the key issues that people should be considering for their investment strategy as they plan their retirement in France? So I, I think the, 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 the ideal situation for Blevins Franks is to be able to have discussions with individuals before they arrive. Um, there are a number of scenarios, particularly with pension, that there might be some action that might be best to do before you become a French tax resident. For example, if you have an opportunity after 55 years of age to take 25% tax-free cash sum, that should be considered. Um, if you have not got that opportunity, there are other ways that planning can, can, can make sure that once you arrive in France, we can maybe do a drawdown. 
Um, we could maybe look at taking larger sums. It all depends on the individual circumstances. But pension is certainly one area that should be looked at. If if an individual takes a lump sum and the pension's retained in the UK, that's okay. We prefer then individuals when they arrive in France that we review that UK asset. Is it worth transferring into a, a, a cure ops, which is a, a bit like an overseas pension, but regulated here in France, um, to start drawing down from that? And I think the thing, once we get the the pension asset into an appropriate asset here in France, it's very similar. The investment structures within the wrapper might be BlackRock, it might be Russell, it might be Royal London, and it's a very similar scenario, but tax efficient in France, a little bit better. Success. And of course, you can draw down your income in euros. The problem with a UK pension, it has to be paid um, in, in sterling. Um, we would also want to speak to people about their ISAs. We'll come on to that later. Premium bonds, national savings certificates. So there's a whole range of things that should be discussed with Blevins Franks before they certainly become a French tax resident. Yeah. Okay, let's let's turn to that tax residence. Um the the rules in the UK are one thing you We've got the statutory residence test to determine whether you are our tax resident in the UK, uh, and then there are the rules in France. Um, could you perhaps explain those rules and and uh, you know how the one works with the other, given they may be different? Yeah, so I mean, I think the, the, there is a lot of grey area, particularly from the French side, but it, it's not actually up to an individual to decide whether or not he is. Are not a French tax resident. There are four main rules that the French will look at to determine whether you're a French tax resident. So before, so as and when you arrive in France, the good thing about the French system is that the tax year runs from January to December. If you arrive in June, you will have a six-month period to the end of December, whereby you submit a tax return the following May. So there is time and there are opportunities to make sure that things are done correctly. But if your main residence is going to be in France, your, your foyer, then that will determine that you're a French tax resident. If you are going to spend more than 183 days or you're coming to France with permanence in mind, you will be a French tax resident. If your principal activity, your main job, um, your main income arises in France, you will be a tax resident. Um, and there's other scenarios. So it, it, it naturally follows that people that are coming to France, if they're coming here permanently, will be a French tax resident, not a UK tax resident. Okay. And um, given the different rules, is it possible actually to be sort of treated as tax resident in France and in the UK? Yes, it is. It is. Um, there is the statutory residency tests. However, it depends on how many days you stay in the UK. However, the French will override that if they deem that your main residence is here or you're here for more than 183 days. So there, there are complex scenarios. I've been here now four years. Everyone that I've ever come, come, come into contact with or has become a client these statutory residency tests have never been needed to be applied, but it may occur, and the answer to your question is yes, but it's it's unlike. Okay. And then um, in terms of the, the, the double tax treaty between France and uh, and the UK, how does that work? Is that, um, does that give people the opportunity? Well, it's, it's a good... Nigel, it's a good thing. Um, after Brexit, the um, double taxation treaty that existed between France and the UK has not changed. It is unlikely to change and it is very effective. So if to give you some examples, if, if you're receiving a pension from the military, teaching, uh, government, that will always be subject to UK tax at source. 
Uh, rental income in the UK is subject to UK tax. But then the double taxation treaty kicks in. So when you complete your French tax return, you have to declare the income that you've received. Of course, the tax that's been deducted. And then the French will make an adjustment and will determine the overall rates of tax that you should pay, taking that into account. But you don't get taxed twice. So the double taxation treaty works very well in a number of income sources. It also works very well in respect of inheritance tax as well. Um, so the double taxation treaty is a good thing, um, but is still needing to be declared, but it's taken into account and not, not taxed twice. Okay. And the double the, taxation treaty has not really got much to do. Sorry, Carol. So the statutory, the statutory residence test is one thing, the double taxation treaty is another, um, but the double ta taxation treaty is, is actually quite beneficial for those, those who have UK income sources still taxed in the UK. Right. Okay. Um, and um, so if, if once you become tax resident in France, um, are you taxed on just income in France or, or worldwide? How does it work? So one, once you become a French um, tax resident, you are taxed on worldwide income and gains in France, um, taking into account the source of income and depending on the double taxation treaty. But you should not pay double tax. But it's it's very similar. We still, in France, we have, which is slightly better than the UK, we have five band rates of tax. Um, the fact that it's the FOIA system, um, Nigel, is good because it depends on the number of parts that are in the house. So if if, if my, my wife and I are in the house together, she has no income. The total income that I have is divided between the two of us. You each then have your own personal allowance. Then the next band up to 12,000 whatever euros is at 11% for both of you. So the, the fact that you've got the FOI system, you've both got your personal allowances and you have five tax bands, the tax is no more um, punitive than in the UK. The difference in France is that we have an addition social charges, and that's slightly different. Right. So I wouldn't worry too much about income tax. It's the social charges that you need to bear in mind, because if you have earnings, you will pay social charges of about 9.7%. If you have pension income, it's about 91 And any income investment from uh, other sources is 17.2%. So the social charges, unlike national insurance, in the UK, but the social charges are important because by paying social charges, you have access to the healthcare system. So I often say to clients, if you've got a hundred thousand income a year and you're paying 10,000 social charges to get into the best healthcare system in Europe, I think that's a fair price to pay. Right. Okay. Um, does you mentioned uh, ISIS premium bonds. Um, those um, obviously are tax free in the UK. Um, what's the sort of treatment when they if people move to the uh, move to France for those? So these are these are assets in the UK that, that we like to talk to clients about before they become a French tax resident. Um, the French tax authorities do not recognise ISAs premium bonds, national savings certificates as tax-free. Here in France, any dividends or gains would be subject to tax at a flat rate of 30%, inclusive of social charges. So they're no way tax efficient. It's not mandatory that you encash these, but we would probably want to have a look at that. Um, and the other thing, technically, you're supposed to declare dividends from ISAs at the end of each month within 15 days. N nobody does that. Um, so they're more from an administration hassle here in France. They're not tax efficient. So they 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 are most likely required to be reviewed by someone like Levin Stranks before they become a French tax resident. 
Okay, and um, you say that you can retain the ISIS and so on. Um, in Spain, I believe you can't add to those ISIS. Presumably, that's the same in France, is it? Yeah, you, there would be no objective from an investment strategy in doing that. Um, and what most people will do is disinvest ISIS, take their tax free cash sum, retain it in a UK bank account arrive in France, meet with Blevins Franks, and then we will discuss an investment strategy for some of that capital to provide income, to be efficient from capital gain tax, to be efficient from succession tax. And we have Livre here in France, which is like a tax efficient bank account. We have Charles V, which is similar to an ISA wrapper. So there are, there, are, there are methods that we can efficiently invest capital that's come from lump sum, ISOs, premium bonds, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so there are good options by the sound of it. So are there any other sort of things that people really should think about before they leave the UK? Um... Um, Nigel, we introduced about 18 months ago, post-Brexit, a new strategic financial planning report we uh, offer this to clients who are still in the UK with maybe 12 months, nine months before they come. And that strategic financial planning report is a, is a big document. And we will deal with things like residency, perhaps as your healthcare, your pensions, uh, the taxes and income and all that is covered in that particular report. Um, and what we do is that that, that we'll, we do all what we need to do to provide that strategic report. When the client arrives in France, we present an additional report having made the adjustments from the original report. Um, so I, I would say that, yes, there are quite a few things that need to be looked at, but um, the strategic financial planning report is certainly something that m most people should at least consider before they get anywhere near arriving in France. Right. Uh, apologies, my um, video has been slightly disrupted. And when that happens, if I switch it off and back on again, it's that. So I haven't disappeared, just the picture has disappeared. So uh, apologies for that. Um, okay. So it, when people move to France, um, obviously they, they're then subject to the French tax system. Will that all seem very familiar or are there a number of taxes that, that maybe um, they're not used to? And so or ways that it works that are uh, different? Um, as, a, I, 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 as I mentioned earlier, the, 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 there are still grey areas. Um, even problem in France is that you might have one accountant down the road has a view of one particular aspect of the tax system and another one up the road with a completely different aspect. We have, have our own tax experts that provide clarification We've had a number of, um, a couple this week already where one person has said one thing and it's not correct and we've had to correct it. Um, it's just it's just about being careful. The advantage is that the tax year in France from January to December gives you an opportunity before the end of next May. So when you submit your first tax return, it's in paper form. So your first year, it's online. We at Blevins Franks have our own tax experts. I have here in Bergerac and around about Limoges, Angoulême, Perigru, our own um, accountants that we refer our clients to. We have avocats, one in particular in Perigru. So we give guidance as to what needs to go on a tax return. We will give you a referral to a good accountant that's English speaking. Um, so there are so many pitfalls, Nigel, so many to mention. It's just about being careful, but individuals do have time to get it correct. Right. And is there a wealth tax in, in France as well as in uh, Spain? Yes, um, we do have a wealth tax here in France for people who are arriving from the UK or, or anywhere. There is a five-year holiday where there is no um, French wealth tax. When you become a French tax resident, wealth tax is on worldwide assets. Um, so it, it, it is something that's given a holiday break for five years. 
Um, there is a 1.3 million euro exemption. Um, if you break over that 1.3, tax kicks in at 800,000 euros from a scale of 0 0.5 to up to 1.5, more than 10 million. But I read an interesting article just a couple of weeks ago that in France, only 350,000 households pay wealth tax. Of that number, only 250, actually 250,000 paid less than 5,000 euros wealth tax. So it's not anything to be majorly concerned about because there are a very small percentage of individuals in France that are actually caught up in wealth tax. And it tends to, it tends to be those who are um, capital rich and not income rich because it only applies to real estate. So things like Sean's B, uh, Curops pensions, it, it doesn't apply to other assets. It's, it's only to real estate. Right. Okay, thanks. Um, so many people will be sort of financing their retirement through um, investment savings, um, uh, private pensions, state pensions. Um, if I could just sort of cover off the state pension side, um, those who may have watched earlier videos will have heard this before, but um, basically, if you're going to get uh, a, your UK state pension once you qualify for that, um, if you're already getting it when you go to uh, France, then you can continue to receive it into your UK account or you can arrange for it to be sent to your account in, in France. If you become of uh, retirement age once you've, or state pension age, once you've moved to France, then you need to deal with the International Pensions Department. Um, and you go to their website, there's a form you can download, and then you need to fill that in, or at least that's the theory. The trouble is that that form starts off with the question, have you ever lived in the UK? It then asks you for every employer you've ever had. Um, it asks for every a house you've ever lived in. Um, and so it becomes an enormously um, pain in um, to, to complete that. The alternative is that you pick up the phone, there's a phone number that's listed on our site if you were to go into the uh, retirement section, um, and you basically just ask answer a few questions and they will uh, put you into the system. Now, in my case, um, nothing happened for a thing, and I didn't get around to calling them for three months, and when I did call them, uh, they said, uh, ah, nothing seems to have happened to your case at all. Um, so we'll put you on the urgent list, and it was dealt with one week later. So the key message in terms of the state pension is very much, um, you know, do uh, do use the phone rather than the forms. It's a, it's a great deal easier. Um, I don't know whether you have anything to add there, George, on the state pension. Otherwise, we'll move on to private. Um, the, the only the only thing I would probably add is that those who are lucky enough to have a UK state pension is actually a very favourable thing here in France. Um, we would normally, I would normally suggest to someone that they complete the Form S1, which you can do once you have a state pension. Once you're here in France, that Form S1 will be registered with CPAM, the French healthcare system, and that Form S1 will give you access to the French healthcare system. Also, having a Form S1 is beneficial from a social charges point of view because you will not pay social charges on your state pension. And having a Form S1 gives us options when we're looking at your pensions in the UK because we can then potentially look at withdrawing lump sums at reduced rates of social charges and tax. So having a, having a Form S1 is actually quite a good thing. Right, excellent, yes. Uh, the other thing to mention perhaps is that um, under the withdrawal agreement, um, the uh, the pensions, if you're moving to the EU, will um, continue to increase along with, with UK pensions. If you, As you may be aware, if you go to uh, Australia, Canada and various other places, then uh, your pension can be whittled away by, by inflation over time. Uh, but that has been an agreement. There's no obviously guarantee that it'll stay forever, but at the moment there's no suggestion that that is going to change. Um, so moving on to the... Um, onto the private pension. Um, I think you mentioned CureOps earlier. Could you perhaps explain a little bit more about you know, the advantages of the CureOps and, and, and how they work? 
Yeah, and I, I, I think any any investment strategy or any um, report requirement for a, a UK pension has to start with a reason as to why would you do that? And there has to be a lot of good value reasons to do that. The problem that we're having at the moment, particularly with the UK pension scenario, are, are changes. Um, there, are, there are statutory changes, there are this change, there is that change. And one of the good things about a cure ops it is, it is an HMRC regulated overseas pension scheme. Our one is, is heavily regulated. Our sits in Malta. And when we were looking at uh, jurisdiction for our cure ops, we looked at um, three, Isle of Man, Jersey and Malta. And Malta was chosen because it is the only one that's a fully fledged member of the EU. Um, we will often look at, is it right to go into cure ops or not? Starting from what might happen in the UK. Because at the moment, if we transfer a UK pension to a cure ops, the Brexit agreement did not affect the overseas tax charge. And the UK at the moment have an overseas tax charge of 25%. So if you were transferring your pension to Canada, Australia, anywhere out with the EU, you will be charged 25% tax. We were very concerned that the UK HMRC were going to introduce that to EU designated countries, but they have not. And the problem with that, Nigel, is how long will that remain? You know, the UK government need money, they need to tax from somewhere, and if I was head of HMRC, um, overseas tax charge would be a good starting place. Um, the reason being, the UK have allowed you to build a pension fund tax efficiently, um, with tax relief, no um, CGT, and then you decide to go to France, why would I not want to penalise you from a tax point of view? And I'm not saying that they will do that, but in the past, if the Chancellor needs to make money, pensions is an easy hit. Um, we also, and I don't want to scare people, but we also had, at the end of the year, a report from the Institute for Fiscal Studies, who are now wanting to raise 1.9 billion by making it so, and this is the study, that if you die before age 75, they will tax you on inheritance tax and they want to start taxing you. Because at the moment, if, if, any, if you've got a UK pension fund and you're not 75 and you die, then that is inherited free of inheritance tax and tax. They, they may change that, Nigel, so one of the reasons that we review UK pensions is to avoid nasty pitfalls going forward. Right, okay. Um, one other question here, uh, the, I've got a civil service pension. Um, is that taxable in France or, or in the UK? So all civil service pensions, local authority, government will be taxed in the UK. We can't change that. You will continue to receive your income at tax, but remember it's subject to the double taxation treaty. Uh, most of my clients will continue to receive that in a UK bank account, and then they will transfer that over to a Euro bank account as and when they see fit. Right. Okay. There's not a lot needs to be done. Not, not, not needs to be a lot done about civil service, teachers, military pensions at all. Right. The NHS is slightly different, isn't it? It's, a, um, it's the NHS pension. No, the NHS, the NHS final salary schemes would, would be the same. Right, okay. Um, looking at property, um, many people sort of retain their property in the UK as a sort of foothold uh, to be able to go back to if things don't uh, change or family circumstances change, etc. Um, or simply to keep in the UK market. Um, if they sort of choose to sell it later on, the consequences um, can be difficult. Is that correct? Um, in that you don't have the um, uh, the um, res uh, residence um, uh, no, eventual abode, sorry, um, exemption anymore. 
So are, are you asking me the question, Nigel, of what happens if somebody's a French tax resident, they've got a UK property? Yeah, so basically, well, they if, sell they, it? if they sell it subsequently, what what are the consequences, essentially? So we, I, I, have, I have two types of clients that come across from the UK. There are those that it's all or nothing. Um, they're going to sell their property. France is a permanent decision on the knowledge that if they need to go back to the UK, they can. And these people will sell their property before they arrive, benefiting from the UK CGT exemptions for main residents, et cetera, et cetera. And then they use the money to buy property here and invest it to live. You then have those that will retain their UK property and will want to rent it. That's fine. Uh, rental income is good. Um, that will be subject to UK tax and is then subject to the double taxation treaty. And the good thing about that, from a social charges point of view, there are no social charges on UK rental income. There's double taxation treaty and there's credits, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the, the second type of client. Then you have the client who wants a boat hole in both. They might go back, they might not. So they're going to keep the UK property. The French tax rules do give you a period of time from the day you become a French tax resident around about 12 months where you've got an opportunity to sell it. But if you're a French tax resident three, four, five years down the line, you will be subject to French CGT on the disposal of that UK property. Right. Okay, so it seems that France is regularly different to uh, Spain and Portugal because uh, well, there you have to get rid of it before you move because from the moment you become tax resident, you pay the full capital gains. So that's interesting. Yeah. And and what, what we have at Blevins Franks is a team and I get asked, should I sell or should I not? What is the tax differences between if I do and if I don't? because French CGT changed in April 2015. Um, that is the date that they will take the value of the UK property. There is an allowance in France of about 12,300 euros, but there are also tax relief, both for capital gains tax and social charges. So if you've had a property for more than 22 years, the relief is 100%. If you've had a property for more than 30 years, that is an exemption from social charges. But I wouldn't worry too much about that. That is something that can be covered in our strategic financial planning report. And that is a very, very important question for everyone. What should I do about my property? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Perhaps we can uh, move on to inheritance tax. Um, I guess if somebody is... Um, in um, France, there are two, a number of aspects to this. One is, what are you allowed to do in terms of inheritance? And two, what are the consequences from a tax perspective, both in France and in the UK? Could you uh, give us an idea on that? Yeah, I, I, will, I will give you a, a broad um, comment. Um, I've, on, I've only been in France for four years in succession tax has been the biggest hurdle for me to get my head around, but I'm nearly there, but we have a good team. And the problem, the problem with, so succession tax in France is the equivalent of, of inheritance tax in the UK. There is still a double taxation treaty between the two countries in both taxes, which adds to the complications. But succession tax here in France is effectively the same as inheritance tax in the UK, but with much um, you know, diff different rules. The, the big problem we had in December last year is that new forced hereditary rules came into being, which effectively affects English, Welsh, Wales. It doesn't affect so much Scottish Wales, but these rules um, effectively meant, at the moment we're, we're giving advice to, to have a French um, will for French assets, having a UK will for UK assets, trying to make sure that we're protecting you from forced hereditary. We think it will change again anyway. But when I when I when Blevins Franks are reviewing what do we do for succession, we start off with the mar mar the marriage regime. Um, what 
is your marriage regime when you arrive in France? Do you have the correct marriage regime? Do we need a PAX, which is like an agreement? It's not quite a, a civil marriage agreement, but it's a written contract that's drawn up by a notaire. And we will provide succession planning, starting off with the marriage regime. Here in France, the nations, I would say, um, not the nations, but between spouses and PACs, there is no succession tax. We still have gift exemptions for spouses and children. So you can gift your spouse 80,000 odd euros. Um, for children, you can gift 100,000. You're allowed to do that each 15 years. Um, but then the other aspect that we look at is your property. And then we'll look at your assets. So there are, with the marriage regime, we can set up on Dantines, we can do on division. Um, in France, they have a wonderful facility called an usufruct, where we can set that against the property, or we can set it against an investment like an insurance fee. Um, but Nigel, what I'm trying to say is that it, it is complicated, that there are a number of very efficient ways of mitigating succession tax. And most importantly, what we have to be careful with in France, if very commonly like myself, if, if you have children from different relationships, it's very important that we put in procedures to protect both spouses and make sure that the money or your wishes go to the right person, particularly to. So I know that doesn't sound very clear because it's not. It's very complicated. Well, I think it it at least gives the fact that um, you know if there is, are significant assets that uh, that will be uh, inherited, uh, you need to both understand what you're allowed to do and also what the tax consequences are, and I guess what sort of planning makes sense to to make sure that you minimise that tax yeah. as much as possible. And, and uh, we start off: Are you married? What is your regime? Do you have children? Do you have children from different relationships? What's your intention? Do you want it all to go to your wife? Do you want it to go to children on second death? You know, we start off with what is it you're actually trying to achieve and then design a plan with investment structures to achieve what your objectives are. And everybody's okay. different. Yeah. Okay, well, many thanks for that. Um, I think that covers uh, the points we, we had to go through. So just finish off by thanking everybody for listening. Thank you, George, for, for your helpful presentation. Um, and as I said at the beginning, if you have any questions, we're happy to answer them. If you want to uh, contact us, expats at expatnetwork.com. And, and George, if people want to contact you direct, how what's the best way of doing that? Um, and what I would suggest in the first instance is to go on to the Blevins Franks website. You can Google France. Um, the partners, my review will come up. Um, if you want to email me direct, uh, my email is on that, but it is george.shepherd at blevinsfranks.com. Um, you can ask Nigel for that email. He has it. Um, and my telephone number is is out of date on the website, um, so it would be best probably to contact me by email. Then we can give you my correct phone number so that the system can get it updated. But either email me at george.shepherd.blevinsfranks.com or, or, or yourself, Nigel, and you can pass on my email to the individual. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, George. Thank you, everybody, for listening, and uh, we'll call it a day there. Thank you very much, George. Cheers.